Want to support ParCast and get exclusive access to early and ad-free episodes? Check out patreon.com slash ParCast to donate today. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash ParCast. Due to the graphic nature of this killer's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. Now, enjoy the show. When terrible things happen, people like to root around for the cause. If you can find the cause, certainly the effect will begin to make more sense. Yet, as we learned in the case of Alexander Pichushkin last week, sometimes seeking the cause just makes everything all the more disturbing it quickly becomes clear just how easily a life can slip into darkness. As a young man, he took a knock to a fragile part of his brain, changing his personality. This led Pichushkin through a childhood of isolation and anger. His grandfather found an outlet for the boy in chess, but when his grandfather died, chess wasn't enough. As the USSR society he knew broke down around him, Pichushkin took his first life in 1992, in the dark woods, of Bitsevsky Park. Yet then, Pichushkin went into hibernation for nine years, engaging in very antisocial behavior. The only time he spent outdoors was at his mind-numbing store clerk position or playing chess in the park. His neuroses were submerged in a slow cooker. But like a train coming into a station, the boiling point was inevitable. The only thing that could keep Pichushkin from killing again was the man himself. And by 2001, he was done restraining himself. The USSR had crumbled. Upward mobility for anyone in Pichushkin's economic bracket was just a dream. And after studying the crimes of Russian serial killer Andrei Chikatilo, Pichushkin had one goal. To kill more people than even Chikatilo, the Rostov Ripper, ever did. There's a story told about Pichushkin from this time period around 2001 to 2002 These were still the early years of his killing spree. But even at this point, he had killed between 20 and 30 people in the Bitsevsky woods. Supposedly, Pichushkin walked right into the local police office, drunk, but with a clear purpose in mind. (coughs) He told anyone that could hear that he was a killer, that he had killed many before, and that he would continue to do so as long as he remained free. He ended this possibly apocryphal rant with a statement that truly defines his innermost character. Because that is what I do. As simple as that, Pichushkin cut through all the paradoxes and mysteries of his journey to becoming a serial killer. It didn't matter what caused this. All that mattered was this is what he had to do. And what he would continue to do. Unless they stopped him. And what did these policemen supposedly do? They laughed him out of the building, calling him a pitiful drunk. They sent the monster of Bitsevsky Woods back out into the wilderness, where he would fulfill his promise to kill again. Why would Pichushkin do this? Why would he risk his entire life just as he found out what he believed to be his calling? Well, that's what we're going to examine this week, as his motivation to risk being caught comes into focus. And as we'll come to see repeatedly as we follow the grim story of Alexander Pichushkin to its conclusion this week, the institutions of post-Soviet Moscow were unprepared to handle a case like the chessboard killers. In these small, impoverished neighborhoods on the outskirts of the city, police were more likely to turn a blind eye to crimes if it made their jobs easier. The less they had to navigate through the complex bureaucratic system of justice, the better. The only thing that could stop Pichushkin was something inside the killer himself. Hi, I'm Greg Polson, and welcome back to Serial Killers, a new podcast diving into the minds and motives of some of the most infamous and notorious murderers. This is part two in our series following the life of Alexander Pichushkin, known both as the Chessboard Killer and the Bitsevsky Park Maniac. If you want to listen to any episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them all in your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe. You can also listen on our website, parcast.com, 
That's spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode comes out every Monday. Visit our Facebook page, Parcast, to join the conversation. To help us figure out the inner workings of Pichuchigan's mind, let's again turn to my co-host and serial killer expert, Vanessa Richardson. Although she's not a psychologist, she's done a lot of research into serial killer psychology and can help us get a deeper look into Pichuchigan's mind during the most dangerous period of his young life. Hi, Greg. If you remember from last week, I really focused in on the tradition of Russian masculinity as a key factor in Pichushkin's development as a killer. Cut off from the world at large, the young Pichushkin still retained the desire to make a name for himself. He had proven that he had the intellectual chops needed with his exploits in chess, but his life still lacked respectability. He was still an unknown, unlike his serial killer idol, Andrei Chikatilo. There was no real sense to Pichushkin's crimes, only a desire and the will to achieve it. Alexander Pichushkin wanted to be recognized as the success that he was. This would turn into a farcical game of back and forth between Pichushkin and the justice system of Moscow. He would act out or come dangerously close to being caught, and then the police would let him slip away yet again. The date was February 23rd, 2002. At this point, Pichushkin had killed close to 20 people. All but one of these were killed in the same fashion, in the recesses of Bitsevsky Park with a blunt object to the head. Afterward, Pichushkin would drop their dead or unconscious bodies down a nearby well that carried them to the Byzantine Moscow sewers, an efficient cleanup method if ever there was one. But on February 23rd, there was a hitch in the process. Pichushkin's victim this time was a pregnant woman named Maria Verachiva. Like many of his potential victims, Pichushkin picked her out of a crowd due to her visible isolation from those around her. Mm, Pichushkin had an eye for these things. He had a practiced and clean way of disposing of his victims, sure, but his most important ability may have been his perception. Isolated and alienated himself, Pichushkin knew all the signs a person gives off when they have few connections in the world few people who might actually worry for them if they vanish into thin air. It seems wholly plausible to me. In this case, Verachiva was particularly vulnerable. She was not a native resident of Moscow. In post-USSR Russia, jobs were scarce in more rural areas where Verachiva was born. But to be employed in Moscow, these migrant workers needed specialized registration papers, expensive ones. Verachiva didn't have the money for registration. She barely had enough money to prepare to have her child. So she entered the city quietly, worked low-paying, high-risk, menial labor jobs, and she tried as best as possible to keep her head down as she walked the streets of Moscow. Mm. Perhaps this lonely life led her to be more susceptible to the charms of an outwardly charming, if somewhat shy, young man. Perhaps long, tedious days of toil made the prospect of a walk through the park seem like a dream come true. It soon became a nightmare. I think it's fair to assume Verachiva turned down any vodka Pichushkin might have offered. His usual methodology wouldn't quite work on an anxious, more cautious pregnant woman. At that point, Pichushkin might have realized that this kill would be more difficult, or at least more challenging. But in the end, like all his victims, Verachiva just wanted someone to speak with, and Pichushkin took advantage. The exact chain of events is unclear. Pichushkin probably drew his murder weapon, be it a metal rod or some other blunt object. He likely got a few strikes in on Virachiva. He cornered the injured Virachiva right where he wanted her, above the well where he dropped his bodies. With all his weight behind him, Pichushkin decided to finish her off with a heavy shove. Virachiva dropped out of sight. For Pichushkin, that was good enough. After all, he had done this many times before. No one had ever made it out of that well. No one. But... Ah! Yet hours later, Pichushkin long gone for the night, the pregnant and injured Maria Verachiva pulled herself out of the well, one agonizing step at a time. An amazing feat for a woman in her condition. It's another fascinating paradox of trauma. In the face of certain death, human beings can completely shut down, while others act more decisively than they ever have in everyday life. Commonly known as the fight or flight response, adrenaline pulses through the body, allowing what seemed to be in hindsight superhuman feats of strength and willpower. 
It's in that way that Maria Virachiva, a pregnant woman, exhausted after a day of hard work and surprised by a violent attack, survived death at the hands of Alexander Pichushkin. Virachiva dragged herself to the closest hospital. Once safely inside, she was visited by the local police. She described the attack and her attacker in great detail to the officers. Their first question to Virachiva, where were her employment registration papers? Oh, after everything this woman had gone through, mm -hmm. the police only cared about this bureaucratic nonsense. <laughs> the USSR may have disintegrated, but the red tape remained. Hobbled by these remaining communistic hang-ups, the justice system was inefficient and narrow-minded. When faced with a woman under attack, the only thing that mattered was whether she was properly authorized to exist in Moscow in the first place. When it became clear that Virachiva did not have the proper authorization, they offered her an ultimatum. If she dropped these accusations about an attack from a Moscow citizen, they would turn a blind eye to her illegal status in the city. Virachiva wanted to make sure her child was safe from people like Pichushkin, yet without the work she received in Moscow, that child would never get a proper shot at life. Virachiva gives in. She agrees to discard her police report and never speak of the attack to the police again. Due to this decision, Virachiva is allowed to remain in Moscow like before, grinding out a living to keep hope alive for her child. The one difference? Virachiva avoids sight of Bitsevsky Park like it's hell itself. Did Pichushkin ever learn that Virachiva survived? Mm, it's impossible to know. Perhaps she just became another X'd off square on the chessboard he kept in his room, another victim successfully fed into the Moscow underground. Maybe he discovered she escaped, but decided to let her go because she seemingly gave him the same honor. Either way, the close call did not set Pichushkin back like it had after his first murder in 1992. In the next two weeks after February 23rd, Pichushkin killed three more people in Bitsevsky Park. Mm. After taking so many lives, there was no chance Pichushkin would go back into hibernation like in 1992. The fear of being caught was clearly gone. In this frenzy, though, we can glimpse that hidden vulnerability. Pichushkin loved to kill, welcomed it into his life. But it was still just an act shared between two people. There was excitement in that initial confrontation in the woods, and a climatic culmination when he dropped the bodies into the well. But afterward, Pichushkin could only go home, to the same small apartment he'd known his entire life. And the only way to keep his life bearable was to get to the next kill as quickly as possible. And to always keep his eyes open for the next victim. The metro stop closest to Pichushkin's home at Tukarinskaya was on Kakovka Prospect. Heading home from work, Pichushkin would disembark his train and head up the stairs to a plaza. The place was always full of life, somewhat unbearable for the reserved Pichushkin. But they were good hunting grounds. A common sight was a group of punks and skateboarders who hung around the food stands. The air was full of smoked meat and cigarettes. Pichushkin often noticed how the kids taking a break from skateboarding would often huddle around the warmth of the food stands, sharing vodka hidden in plastic cups from the lazy eyes of the patrolling policemen. What could Pichushkin have seen in these kids, so different than how he was at that age? It was probably contempt. Kids wasting their time with skateboarding when they could be learning the art of chess. But there was one relatable thing about them. And it gave Pichushkin an idea. One afternoon, as he emerged onto the plaza, he spotted 13-year-old Mikhail Lobov hanging around with his punk friends. With an offered cigarette and the promise of a bottle of top-shelf vodka, Mikhail left with Pichushkin and headed to Bitsevsky Park. Mikhail stands out as one of the youngest chosen victims of Pichushkin. For me, this is a classic case of Pichushkin trying to take revenge against the youth he never had. As the two wormed their way into the depths of Bitsevsky Park, Pichushkin likely tried to charm Mikhail and establish some sort of mutual respect between the two. This was his usual routine, but with Mikhail, the intention seems even more obvious. Pichushkin wanted Mikhail to admire him before he took his life. That would be the purest form of vengeance for Pichushkin's lost childhood. Things proceeded as usual. Pichushkin knocked Mikhail over the head and tossed the boy over the edge of the well. 
However, once again, Pichushkin fled the scene too early. If he had been more careful, he might have realized that Mikhail's punk nature saved him. His ragged jacket caught on the outcropping in the well. Like Virachevo, Mikhail was able to climb out. What a stroke of luck. Mikhail rushed to tell a cop, but the officer didn't believe some punk kid running around late at night. A week passed, and poor Mikhail Lobov was living in a constant state of paranoia. With his friends outside the station at Kakovka Prospect, Mikhail saw the demon emerge from the smog of the subway. Alexander Pichushkin once again on his way home. Mikhail rushed to one of the officers stationed nearby and pointed out Pichushkin as his attempted murderer. The cop ignored Mikhail, smelling the vodka on his breath. Mm, but Mikhail Lobov wouldn't give up. He jumped up and down, pulling at his hair, yelling directly in the officer's face as Pichushkin, trying to keep a straight face, passed right by them. <laughs> the cop shoved the kid off of him and threatened him with arrest unless he went home and stopped telling tall tales. Oh. Mm -hmm. Years later, in captivity, Pichushkin would recount this very story, almost wistful. He would observe that no cop would believe some kid that hangs out at the metro drinking all day. It still gave Pichushkin great joy, all those years later, to have come so close to the law so many times and still escape unscathed. As for Mikhail Lobov, he was lucky to survive, and Pichushkin never came after him again, satisfied enough that no one believed Lobov's accusations. Like Virachev, Lobov had to face the truth. Even with the regime of the USSR in the rear view, Moscow was not safe from its demons. Now that we've examined the environment in which he was operating, let's focus back on Pichushkin himself. Vanessa, if we wanted to imagine a typical day at home for Alexander Pichushkin, what do you think we might see? Well, aside from that ominous chessboard tracking his progress in his one-sided competition against killer Andre Chikatilo, we'd probably see a stack of books. Sitting atop the pile was always one in particular. Pichushkin's favorite, not a Russian classic, but a perennial American landmark of self-help, how to win friends and influence people. Pichushkin's favorite book was a self-help book? Yeah, ironic, <laughs> but true. He's not the only infamous killer to have loved this particular manual. Charles Manson is well known for using the instructions and tips from the book to brainwash his various family members in the 1960s. Oh. Yeah, while the book has helped many average people over the years, it has proven very successful in assisting narcissistic and sociopathic personalities in manipulation. It also painted these tactics in the context of another world, the Western world, a world far away from any that Pichushkin ever understood. Mm, that's a good point. It was also a realm where someone had the ability to move up in the world, powered by sheer force of will and intelligence. Such a world appealed greatly to Pichushkin, that's part of what drove him, after all, to craft his own reality, where he was the most powerful and intelligent person of them all. The book supplied him a charismatic guide to charming people, to making them trust him, to making them susceptible. It's clear why such a book would appeal to Pichushkin, even if he himself wasn't trying to win any friends, just victims. Pichushkin never valued friendship very much. If we think back to his first kill, after all, it was a pal from school. Mm -hmm, that's right. Pichushkin killed many types of people, but he always held a special place in his heart for the ones he felt closest to. His supposed friends, his neighbors, his co-workers. The more of a bond he could establish with someone before the murder, the more powerful and pleasurable the act became for Pichushkin. In his own words, a reenactment from a Q&A Pichushkin gave to the press later in his life. For the record, was there a clear difference for you between killing those with whom you were more friendly? First of all, what is a friend? This is not someone who gives you 100 rubles or lets you stay over for a night. And secondly, my principle was to the grave and that's it. Yes, I received more pleasure from killing people whom I knew personally, but I also found a way to get to strangers, and that is not easy. To get to those strangers, Pichushkin had to study. So with his obsession with that particular book, we can determine that he really wasn't leading a double life. No, Pichushkin lived a single life, his own. He got up, went to work, killed, and came home. While he kept this secret from his family, neighbors, and co-workers, it was not as if he ever pretended he was doing anything else. No one questioned the quiet young man about his lifestyle. 
Sure, he might drink too much and spend too much time alone, but he was a chess genius and always a shy kid. How could his mother, Natasha, or sister, Katya, know the difference? They were busy living their own lives. By this point, Katya had gotten married and Tukurinskaya had gotten even more crowded, with both her husband, also named Alexander, and their son, Sergei, staying in Natasha's cramped abode alongside Pichushkin and his mother. There was barely enough room in the world for Pichushkin to live one life. So no, unlike some serial killers, Pichushkin's life was more unified. He was always planning his campaign of murder, even when it appeared like he was just playing a friendly game of chess or quietly reading a book in the corner of his home. By the spring of 2003, Pichushkin was up to his 32nd victim. This man was a true local who hung out in Bitsevsky Park, and much like Pichushkin, he was a drunk. Pichushkin observed for hours as the man sat drinking and smoking alone on the street after a day in the park. This was typical behavior for the killer. He had to watch and wait until there was no one around before he would approach the potential victims in public. His observational skills had evolved at this point. He could pick the loneliest people out of a crowd without ever even needing to speak with them. After making his best guess, he would approach and engage, seeking confirmation of what he already knew, that this person was vulnerable to murder. Mm, in Pichushkin's mind, it was a dangerous world. He was just living naturally in accordance with it. Victim 32 was in a foul mood, so he wasn't a hard sell. He was an alcoholic through and through, so the offered vodka got the job done. Even so, Pichushkin's biggest fear was that the man would be too mad to even want to take a walk into the woods. But soon enough, his worries were assuaged. Victim 32 was safely in his grasp now. Drinking in the usual spot, Pichushkin turned to his victim and reportedly asked a question. If you were granted a wish, just one, what would it be? To stop drinking. I promise you, today will be the day you stop drinking. Oh. A subtle difference had begun to develop in Pichushkin's violence in these years. He took to using the bottle to strike his victims, cutting straight to the case. Once the body hit the ground, Pichushkin would bend down over the unconscious victim or corpse. He would continue to destroy the body, smashing it over and over with a cold, solid bottle of vodka. As their skulls began to cave in, Pichushkin would shove the bottle inside. Oh. Just as we mentioned last week, when speaking about Pichushkin's warped dopamine reward system, he was constantly being pushed further in his desires. Damage to his frontal lobe caused a strange feedback cycle in his mind when it came to experiencing pleasure. When one horrific action was exhausted, he needed to test the waters, going even deeper into violence and feeding the growth of his addiction. But his violence was not the only thing growing to the extreme, because violence was not enough for him anymore. Pichushkin believed he was accomplishing some great deed, a legendary feat. And so far, only Pichushkin and his two luckiest victims knew anything about his capabilities. There was something self-destructive being nurtured inside of him. In layman's terms, Pichushkin was getting sloppy, risking messier crime scenes and less isolated victims. Because maybe somewhere deep inside Pichushkin, what he wanted more than anything was to be known for his crimes. On a cold November night in 2005, something different appeared near Bitsevsky Park. The police. A fresh body had been discovered. Nikolai Zakarchenko, victim 41 for Pichuskin. An old man, yes, but something else too. An ex-cop. I wonder if Pichushkin knew this when he left the body out instead of dumping it down into the sewers like usual. Mm, a cry for help? No. I think it would have been more like a challenge, issued to the police who so far seemed so complacent in their efforts to stop him. If that was the intention, it worked. Although people have been disappearing around this area for years, and despite the two times that victims came forward claiming to be attacked in the woods, a real investigation had never been authorized. With the death of Zakarchenko, Pichushkin finally got what he so desperately wanted, a manhunt for the mystery killer of Bitsevsky Park. There's a historical account of Pichushkin from this time that perfectly illustrates this desire. At this point, news coverage picked up on the idea that a killer, 
possibly even a serial killer, might be wandering the woods of Bitsevsky. At this point, the name Bitsevsky Park Maniac entered the lexicon. One night, Petushkin sat at home, watching television with his mother Natasha and sister Katya. A report came on focused on the Bitsevsky Park Maniac. The people of Tukurinskaya and the surrounding apartment complexes were worked into a fever pitch. Finally, the mysterious disappearances that had plagued so many that lived around here began to make sense, and the truth might be more horrible than they ever imagined. On that particular night, Petushkin noticed that his sister Katya was completely absorbed in the report, following every word and obsessing over every small clue that might point towards some sort of truth. Mm, Petushkin felt anxious, butterflies in his stomach, an almost unbearable urge to turn to his sister and tell her, fulfill her desire to solve the mystery by solving it for her. The impossible monster, the all-powerful killer, the giver of fear, he sat right beside her in the body of her brother. His brain was spinning. The risks he had taken in leaving Zakharchenko out in the open paid off. His dopamine reward system was blasting on all cylinders. He had found a way to push the envelope of his risk-taking personality even further. Even Pichushkin could barely control it. It was dangerous, it was unstable, and it was undeniably exciting. For Pichushkin, excitement was enough. It was the only thing that gave his life any warmth anymore, that excitement, and the excitement of the kill itself. So like a mad clock, Pichushkin beat onwards, intentionally reckless. More bodies were left out. One morning, a particularly grisly sight emerged when a man out for a walk discovered a pack of wild dogs devouring bones that clearly belonged to a human. Dumping his problems into the sewer was too easy after all, Pichushkin decided. It was so smart, it was almost cheating. And you can't cheat in chess, not if you want to be the best. For their own part, the police finally caught on. There was a serial killer in Bitsevsky Park, and they had been responsible for allowing this problem to emerge in the first place. They had ignored the warning signs for too long. And if they couldn't stop this maniac, the department's reputation would take an irreparable hit. Long months of investigation dragged onward. Bodies were occasionally found, but they never caught a sign of the victim entering the woods with another person. Pichushkin was still careful in that regard, or perhaps old habits just die hard. Either way, police scoured the park all day and all night. But again, Bitsevsky Park occupied nearly 3,000 acres. It wasn't easy to canvas the whole thing, especially with the justice system in an organizational upheaval following the fall of the USSR. Let's turn back to Alexander Bukhanovsky, the serial killer expert who assisted in the capture of Andrei Chikatilo. He had this to say about the current system and the efforts of perestroika, the liberalizing effort within the Communist Party that brought about the end of the Soviet Union. Before perestroika, the system was much better. There was a process. It was more methodical. Now, the police don't know very much. Harsh words, but it's not hard to see the truth in them, especially after what happened to Pichushkin's victims, Maria Vircheva and Mikhail Lobov. They were clearly failed by the system. The Soviet Union was over, but problems remained, and some worsened. Again, this just points back to the essential fact that Pichushkin was crafted by his times. In the purgatory between the USSR and the new Russian Federation, he was able to perfectly exploit the blind spots and lazy bureaucracy of the new regime. The Interior Ministry, the most authoritative law enforcement agency in the Federation, took charge, led by star investigator Andrei Supernenko. Supernenko specialized in tracking down serial killers. In fact, he delighted in it. Yet even for Supernenko, it was difficult to find motive in all these killings. There was only the pattern and the knowledge that, for some reason, the killer was getting sloppy. Without some further insight, the Bidsevsky Park maniac would remain free. Pichushkin would have to do himself in. And in the summer of 2006, his self-destructive nature finally went too far. We'll dive further into Pichushkin's self-destructive nature, but first, let's take a quick break. Yeah, working on a show like Serial Killers, we need all the help we can get falling asleep at night. <laughs> One big help? 
Casper mattresses. We both have them, and my Casper is the most comfortable mattress I've ever slept on. The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Their supportive memory foams create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. And if you're wondering about memory foam, it's insanely supportive. It is. The day my mattress arrived, I threw out my back and had to go to the chiropractor. Now that's not the first time I've thrown out my back and usually it takes a couple of weeks or months to heal. Well, I slept on the Casper mattress and two days later, my back pain was gone. I'm not saying it's a miracle healer, but no way would I have felt better that quickly if that mattress wasn't truly supportive. That is amazing. And you're not alone, Greg. With over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars, it's quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress. So try Casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. They even offer free shipping and returns to U.S. and Canada. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. Get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com killers and using offer code killers. That's C-A-S-P-E-R dot com slash killers. Terms and conditions apply. June 14th was an average day for Marina Moskalieva. She woke up, sent her kid off to school, and headed for another day at work at the market. It's unclear whether or not she was aware of this market's previous employee, Larissa Kulagina, who vanished a few years ago after work one night. However, she was very aware of the Bitsevsky Park maniac, just like everyone else. Which might be the strangest aspect of Marina's decision that night. But we all know Alexander Pichushkin was convincing, he had studied his whole life for it, adapting his social chess moves to perfection. Work let off at the usual time on the 14th. Marina wanted to go home and get dinner prepared before her family got home, but Pichushkin offered a walk through the park. Marina was skeptical and perhaps some sort of danger alert went off inside her head. After all, she left a note for her son telling him where she had gone and who she had gone out with. Strangely enough, Pichushkin knew she did this he knew that there was a glaring flaw in his planned murder, and he still went forward with the usual steps. Hours went by. Marina's son came home and discovered the note, but not his mother. That's when he turned on the TV and saw the news about a woman's body found at Bitsevsky Park. Her son picked up the phone and called Pichushkin. Marina had left his number next to his name in the note. When the killer answered, Marina's son asked if Pichushkin knew where his mother was. Hmm. In an odd move, perhaps relaying to us the information that Pichushkin was mentally prepared to give himself up, the killer simply said he hadn't seen Marina in two months, an impossibility as they worked together every day. The son called his father, who relayed the note to the police. Chief Investigator Andrei Supernenko was ready to close in. We had the note and we had video footage of Pichushkin and this woman getting on the metro at Novye Cheryomushki and getting off at Konkovo, so we naturally suspected him. Konkovo was the closest metro stop to Bitsevsky Park. Within two days, Supernenko was certain and almost surprised at how easy Pichushkin had made it for them. On June 16, 2006, his mother Natasha was finishing up some late night chores when heavy knocks sounded on the door. Then, the police, heavily armed, let themselves in. Natasha later spoke about the night, still looking back at it in a daze. She couldn't comprehend what the police would want from her beloved Pichushkin, who she still called by his nickname, Sasha. The police were kind to me. They said they just wanted to talk to him about some burglaries. But I thought there were a lot of police for a burglar. And I asked Sasha, did you rob someone? And he said, no. That was Pichushkin's last night of freedom. He was taken away from Tukurinskaya, the only home he ever knew, and thrown into jail. All night, the police tore apart Natasha's small apartment, searching for any evidence they could find. One item of note was Pichushkin's hidden chessboard, with 60 of the 64 squares marked off in black ink. Soon enough, the media would find a new name for the Bitsevsky Park maniac one much more appealing than the charmless average Alexander Pichushkin. And so, the chessboard killer was born. For months, the Interior Ministry chipped away at Pichushkin's defenses, trying to get inside. 
For Andrei Supernenko, who led the questioning, it was a puzzle. For Pichushkin, it was the ultimate chess game. The two men would sit across from one another with a glass plate between them. Each would light a cigarette. And the game began in earnest from there. We were in shock when we realized how many people he killed. In the beginning, we only had 13 bodies. And then Pichushkin began to tell us that he'd killed more than 60 people. He wanted to talk. All maniacs want to talk. It made him feel important. I told him I admired him and he liked that. And then he opened up. It was very important for Pichushkin that people think he was a hero. So, I made him feel like a hero. Pichushkin finally had what he wanted, a willing audience and an amazed witness. All of his impressive tales of murder came spilling out. Later diagnosed by the Serbsky Institute as sane, the top Russian psychology researchers did label Pichushkin with antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders. Supernenko exploited that narcissism and built his case. For a killer so hard to catch, the prosecution was simple. In fact, Pichushkin wanted the police to find and confirm as many kills as possible. He needed to beat Andrei Chikatilo's score, after all. Through these sessions, Supernenko came to realize that even if Pichushkin reached 64 kills, filling his chessboard of death to completion, he would not have been able to stop. The compulsion was too strong now. The Moscow public was lucky that Pichushkin needed validation so badly. If he hadn't felt the need to bring his crimes into the light, he could still have been killing under the cover of darkness to this day. For his part, serial killer expert Alexander Bukhanovsky believes that Pichushkin was still motivated by baser instincts, sexual ones. For the serial killer, the process of preparing to kill and killing is an erotic experience. Bukhanovsky hoped to pin a final and definitive meaning onto Pichushkin's crimes. It's certainly true that killing gave Pichushkin a sexual thrill. Pichushkin himself later described how he would often sexually climax during the act itself. However, unlike a killer such as Chikatilo, I don't believe Pichushkin's murders were solely motivated by pent-up sexual frustration. He killed to make himself powerful and eventually visible to the world that often ignored him, the world that he couldn't fully process or understand. Pichushkin desired his official kill count to be greater than Chikatilo's. But again, the killer himself proved to be his own biggest roadblock. Supernenko wanted every name, every kill. But Pichushkin wasn't wired that way. Human life is not too long. It is cheaper than a sausage. My lawyer, I would have cut him open like a fish. I would have killed him like an insect. And I would have received much pleasure from the process. I would cut him up and make belts out of his flesh. But as for remembering everyone I killed, who and when and where, that I don't remember. I don't even care to remember. So the police were on their own, but they had enough evidence. The family members of missing people from the area came forward, now finally understanding what had happened to their loved ones and who had been their executioner. Neighbor Natasha Fyedosova, daughter of Pichushkin's 36th victim, Boris, had this to say. There was total shock when we heard it was Sasha Pichushkin. He was always very calm, always by himself. I thought it was strange that he only wanted to kill people he knew. If he had killed people he didn't know in another neighborhood, it wouldn't have been as bad. But he killed people he knew. Another account, more concise, comes from Valentin Pronyan, the brother of Yevgeny Pronyan, Pichushkin's second victim. Life is hard. There is no money, no jobs. Police are corrupt. Some people stay quiet. Pichushkin freaked out, became aggressive. Doesn't get much simpler than that. It was easy enough for the courts, too. By October 27, 2007, Pichushkin was sentenced to life in prison, guilty of 48 murders, despite his protestations in court that he had killed at least 60, if not more. So when Pichushkin was carted away from the vengeful public, it was not his imagined victory. It was in defeat. Despite all he had done, the official records would show his verified kill count forever at 48 five murders shy of Chikatilo's record. Sent away to maximum security prison, 
hidden deep in the cold Russian mountains, Pichushkin would never see Bitsevsky Park again. In the end, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't kill away the compulsions inside himself and never managed to live up to the legacy in his head. Now he was just another man in a cell. His self-conceived superiority was revealed to be a hollow promise, just like the Soviet Union. He was not the ideal Russian man. He was just another lowlife now, eating bad prison food and staring at blank walls. And unfortunately for Pichushkin, there were no chessboards allowed. Thank you for joining us for our second week of investigation into Alexander Pichushkin, the chessboard killer of Moscow's Bitsevsky Park. Vanessa, as always, I thank you for your insights and analysis. Of course, Greg. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to Serial Killers on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or any other podcast directory. Or through our website, parcast.com. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode of Serial Killers comes out every Monday. So please let us know what you think and join the conversation on our Parcast Facebook page. You can tweet us at Parcast Network. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T Network. And as always, thank you for listening. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler and developed by Ron Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Joel Stein and Maggie Admire. Serial Killers is written by Jack Bentel and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. The amazing cast of voice actors includes, by alphabetical order, Mike Capozzi and Nicholas Masu. Want to support ParCast and get exclusive access to early and ad-free episodes? Check out patreon.com slash ParCast to donate today. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash ParCast 